So I'm going to kick off for the first 10 minutes, just giving a very brief introduction to the Sense Cog program, and then talk about some of the interventions that we have been developing and evaluating over the past few years. So all the work we've been doing has been under the guise of um, the SenseCog program, which is an EU funded um, Horizon 2020 research program that started five years ago and is due to finish this June. It's involved eight EU countries, a number of investigators, as well as industry partners. And it falls under the theme of improving mental well-being in older adults. So I think everyone on the call will be very familiar with this notion of aging related vision, hearing and cognitive impairment really traveling in tandem and overlapping significantly to the point whereby we have this crucible of multimorbidity and all of these factors overlap and impact on each other. What we see in the place that I work, because I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, not a psychologist, Carol, <laughs> um, I work in a memory clinic and at the clinical interface, we see that hearing problems are significantly under-identified in people living with dementia. And this pie graph here comes from work we did about 15 years ago in Manchester, in which we saw that nearly 80% of people coming to memory clinics had under-identified memory uh, hearing impairment. Now, unfortunately, in looking back at these data now and repeating the audits, these figures haven't changed very much suggesting that we have a lot of work to do still in terms of identifying hearing difficulties in this particular population. Because the evidence that hearing loss and dementia are linked is growing. And I'll just share with you a very nice meta-analysis from one of my young colleagues at GBHI, uh, David Loughran, who looked at 36 studies of cognition and pure tone audiometry. Now, why this is important is because many of these studies have only used self-report hearing impairment, whereas here we actually have an objective measure of hearing impairment. And although most of these studies have been cross-sectional, there was a significant association found between hearing loss and cognitive performance, hearing loss and cognitive impairment, as well as hearing loss and dementia. So clearly this is something we can no longer ignore. What about vision? I'll draw your attention to the PROVIDE study, which was a number of years ago, led by Michael Bowen from the College of Optometrists, but I think it's very much a landmark study in trying to understand what the prevalence of visual impairment is in people living with dementia in various contexts, namely in the community, in care homes, in clinic settings, and so on. And again, like with hearing, what was found is that, was that a significant proportion of older people with dementia have unidentified vision impairment. And I think the key take home message is that 50% of those with undetected vision impairment are correctable with lenses. In other words, a simple, low cost intervention that potentially could make a significant difference. And also of the remainder, which were not corrected, correctable by lenses, about 50% could be corrected by cataract surgery, again, an accessible cost-effective intervention. So what is the impact of hearing and vision impairment in the context of cognitive difficulties with aging? Let's just take a look at the question of hearing and vision loss and cognitive decline using findings from the SenseCog program. We looked at a number of different data sets, including the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, the Pan-European Share data set, which looked at thousands of people over a number of years to track their cognitive and other functions. And what we see here is that the black line at the top across all these different data sets, we see the natural expected decline in cognition with age. The blue line is a more rapid trajectory of decline in people with a single sensory impairment. In other words, either hearing or vision. So the question of course, is there an additive effect if you have both hearing and vision impairment? And indeed, if you look at the red line here, which is the bottom of all of these graphs, you can see an even more rapid decline in aging related cognition if you have dual sensory impairment. And again, similar patterns across these several large data sets. What about the impact of sensory impairment on people already with dementia? What kind of outcomes are important here? Well, First of all, we know that we can see an increase in challenging behavior or behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia, 
often leading to the increased use of antipsychotics, particularly in care home settings. And this is important because as an old age, old, an old age psychiatrist, geriatric psychiatrist, I'm working every day trying to decrease the impact or the use of antipsychotics in people living with dementia. This has been a major focus of our profession for the past decade. Sensory impairment in dementia can also exaggerate communication barriers, result in greater dependency of the person with dementia. This in turn leads to higher rates of carer burnout and reduced quality of life for both the person with dementia and their care partner. And also their health economic impacts because we see higher cost of care for a number of reasons. So a key question that we're trying to solve at the moment, does sensory rehabilitation prevent dementia? And I imagine that most people on the call will be very familiar with the key factors that are important risk factors to prevent dementia. Of these, midlife hearing impairment is one of the most important. What we don't entirely know is that if we correct this hearing impairment, will it prevent dementia? And the way to determine this is with, with, is with prospective controlled randomized trials of people at risk of dementia, in other words, with mild cognitive impairment, whether they receive hearing aids or not, and see whether they then convert to dementia or not, or at a slower rate. Now, these trials are ongoing. They take a long time. We don't have the answers yet. And of course, they're very challenging to do. The ethical issues, namely if you identify hearing impairment in someone and you don't provide hearing aids, we have a problem on our hands. However, there are other ways of looking at these data. Now, it's a complex question, and I think the, the answer is emerging that there is likely some degree of prevention involved. However, I won't address this any further today in the interest of time. Instead, I'm going to ask a slightly different question. Does sensory rehabilitation improve outcomes in people already living with dementia? And we looked at this a number of years ago, published this in 2018, to understand what the literature was in terms of interventions for hearing and vision impairment to improve outcomes. We found 12 studies of hearing interventions, five studies of vision interventions, but unfortunately, most of these were of low to moderate quality. There was really only one high quality RCT of a hearing aid intervention that we identified. And the types of sensory interventions that were reported included provision of hearing aids, assisted living, listening devices, teaching communication strategies, hearing aid troubleshooting, cochlear implantation. On the vision side, the provision of prism lenses, rehabilitation training, and cataract surgery. But clearly, in view of the poor quality of the evidence, we decided that we need to take this further. And so we designed a study to look at improving sensory cognitive health for people living with dementia in their own homes, in the community. And this was the SenseCog trial. But first we had to develop the intervention and we did this over 18 months of intervention modeling and intervention development program. And then we had to feasibility test the intervention. And we did this in the SenseCog field trial with 19 dyads, a dyad being a person with dementia living at home and their care partner. And we conducted this field trial in the UK, Cyprus and France. So what did the intervention look like? Well, this is what's called a multi-component complex intervention, which can be tailored to each individual. So no two people get exactly the same intervention, but they all get core components. And this includes a full hearing and vision assessment, glasses and hearing aids if necessary. And critical to this type of intervention is the input of a sensory support therapist or what we call adherence support to help the person adapt to their hearing aid and glasses because the drop-off and non-use and loss of adherence in people with dementia and hearing aids is extremely high. Very typically the hearing aids end up in the drawer or in the dog's mouth or under the bed. So the other elements of the sensory support therapist input was basic pragmatic advice about the sensory environment, looking at acoustics, lighting, and so on. Communication training with a care partner, and also social networking. So typically when people develop dementia, they very often withdraw from society and the world becomes more narrow. If they have vision and hearing impairment on top of that, that exaggerates the loss of social networking. And through the pandemic, we've seen the significant negative impacts of social isolation and loneliness in everyone in society, but particularly in people with dementia and their care partners. So what did we find? Well, 
with caution because this was a small study, of course. What we found was that quality of life improved significantly pre and post intervention. So this was important for us to understand whether quality of life would be a valid outcome marker going forward into a definitive large scale trial. We also found improvements in neuropsychiatric symptoms based on the NPI or the neuropsychiatric inventory. We also saw an improvement in self-efficacy and relationship satisfaction. And again, thinking about important outcomes in people living with dementia, these tick that, that box. So using this information and the learnings about the intervention and the delivery of trial, oh, correction, sorry, one more. And we also looked at care partner outcomes and we saw decreased caregiver burden, but we also saw a slight decrease in relationship satisfaction. Not entirely sure what to make of that, but that's a question we have for the larger scale trial. We did some preliminary health economic outcomes and what we found is that the amount of time that carers would spend supporting the person with dementia in terms of the activities of daily living dropped by a number of hours per month. However, their interpersonal support in terms of communication, in terms of helping them with their devices like adherence support with the hearing aid increased. We did a number of qualitative interviews with 10 of the dyads and we saw similar findings supporting what we saw in our quantitative data. There appeared to be high acceptability of the intervention, increased knowledge and awareness of both the person with dementia and their care partner, improved socialization, decreased caregiver burden and improved functional ability. So in the interest of time, I won't go through all these quotations, but you can see our publication. So this then provided information for the SENSCOG RCT. So a large scale, fully powered, definitive RCT, randomized controlled trial across multiple sites in Europe. Our primary outcome based on our feasibility study was quality of life at 36 weeks. We're looking at a number of secondary outcomes, including functional ability. So that's the person's overall cognitive functional ability, as well as hearing and vision functional ability, cognitive function, behavior, relationship satisfaction, caregiver well-being and also cost effectiveness. And so where are we? Well, I'm very pleased to say that this was the last week of the study. We had our last patient, last visit finally achieved after three difficult years, including lockdown. As you can see, our recruitment curve here had a bit of a drop off midway, but we were able to recoup. And we believe we have enough power to give a definitive result. And we're now in the process of cleaning the data and we'll have data lock in a month or so from now with results released in June. Importantly, we found no serious adverse effects related to the intervention. And of all those who received the intervention, only five people reported low grey adverse events. And usually these were things such as discomfort in wearing, wearing the hearing aids and so on. So we've taken this now one step further, and we're thinking about putting and adapting the intervention, this multi-part intervention into the care home setting. Now a care home setting is a very complex ecosystem and different from a person living at home, whereby the intervention is very much focused on the individual and their care partner, working with a sensory support therapist. In contrast, in a care home, we have multiple levels that we need to consider. And I'll leave this for Helen to discuss. I think she's the last talk and she will be able to tell us more about the SenseCog Care Home Trial, which has now been funded by the Health Research Board's DEFA scheme. So I'm going to leave it there and um, pass on to our next speaker. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Erosima, for a very clear presentation and um, great to, to see those results. And as you say, during the challenging time of COVID that the, the research project was able to continue. And uh, you'll hear, as Irisim was saying there, you'll hear about the SenseCog Care Project, um, which Helen will talk about um, in, a, in a little while. Uh, so I'll hand you over now to our next speaker, who's Dr. Jenna Littlejohn from the Manchester Centre for Audiology and Deafness at the University of Manchester in the UK. Jenna is going to talk about international guidelines on the management of hearing and vision impairment in people with dementia. And she's also then going to talk about a research project which was looking at professionals' views of managing hearing and vision impairment in a memory clinic. So over to you, Jenna. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I will start off by talking about the practice recommendations, which we managed to publish last year. Uh, sorry, we're not moving. 
Okay, so a little bit of background. Um, obviously, we've, we've sort of had the, the overview from here already, um, but hearing and vision impairments highly prevalent in the aging population, and even more so in people with living with dementia. Um, we heard how sensory impairments impact and exacerbate many outcomes for people with dementia in terms of functional decline, cognitive decline, um, challenging behaviours, reduced quality of life, but unfortunately they often remain um, overlooked. And this can be due to various uh, different reasons. Uh, it could be due to the misattribution of symptoms by care providers, by the patients themselves, um, often the early stages of cognitive impairment symptoms are similar to those of sensory impairment. Patients might not be able to verbalize any difficulties they're having, but also at the professional level, um, we've seen that there are um, gaps in terms of assessment and service provision, but also historically poor interdisciplinary communication, meaning that um, you know, dementia professionals do very well in looking after somebody with dementia, hearing professionals do very well looking after somebody with hearing loss, but putting them together, um, there's often challenges in this, this group of people that are, that are not addressed. Uh, and so this is what I'm going to talk about for um, the sort of during my talk, which nicely sort of shows the two different research projects. Um, so to just start with, a few years ago, we wanted to, to address this and look at um, healthcare professionals' views internationally. So we um, took together dementia, hearing, vision professionals in a wide-scale survey and also expert reference group to try and probe some more questions. And we could see that actually professionals were aware of the overlaps between the sensory and cognitive domains. Um, but when we asked about screening tests in the other domains or referral pathways for positive screens, we could see that their awareness was much reduced. So actually suggesting that, um, you know, the professionals kind of understand that, that the, the other one's important for their field, but they don't really know, you know, how to screen for it or what they would do with this information. And this was nicely echoed by understanding that actually their knowledge of what that means in terms of the assessment for dementia. So, you know, if I screen somebody for hearing and vision impairment and I see that they have it, um, what does this mean for my dementia assessment? What does it mean for the management? Um, so we could really sort of start to understand that professionals' um, knowledge is, is much reduced in this field as well. Um, and similarly, this is because they didn't feel that they had the training or expertise to be able to understand the other domain. And then um, another question we asked was understanding the usefulness of guidelines in the other domain. And we can see that actually nearly 100% of all professionals felt that it would be useful um, to have some pragmatic evidence or guidance um, on how they can address the, the sensory cognitive um, overlaps. So this is what we did. Um, so we, as part of um, a sort of a, a, a part of SenseCog, Professor Leroy got together a task force of 16 members across internationally. Um, and these were clinicians, academics, academic clinicians who were all um, sort of experts within their fields of sensory cognitive health and whatever they were doing. And what we wanted to do was to, was to provide the first set of interdisciplinary practice recommendations um, directed at clinicians and other professionals involved in the day-to-day -day care and management of people living with dementia and sensory loss. Um, these recommendations, they're not discipline specific, so we wanted to make them broad enough that they could be encompassed by the three different uh, professional groups. So, um, one of the things we we looked at in the past is actually, you know, guidelines obviously are based on based either for dementia professionals or they're based for hearing professionals. They're not interdisciplinary. And this is something that we wanted to address in this first set of, of recommendations. There was four phases to developing the guidance. Um, so to start with, we reviewed the literature. And so we were able to generate a list of options and identify gaps in knowledge. We then set about filling in the gaps in the evidence, and this was done through various stakeholders consultations, um, and we were able to generate sort of what we termed a longer list of options that we could then look through. We then prioritised the evidence as a task force through various consensus meetings, and we managed to refine the recommendations into six key domains. 
So they were awareness and knowledge, recognition and detection, evaluation, management, support and services and policies. So sort of understanding that actually, you know, awareness and knowledge and services and policies are um, they're, they're not sort of recommendations. How, how can you recommend somebody has awareness, you know, has awareness? But we felt these were really important to give their own domain, um, even though these these aspects will feed into all the other domains. We thought these were really important that, especially in this first set of recommendations, they have their own space um, and, and you'll sort of see it as we go through. Um, we then uh, did various online questionnaires to be able to prioritise the recommendations. And we wanted to try and find um, the recommendations which were the most effective across various different criteria. So the we wanted to uh, find recommendations that had the potential to reduce the burden of dementia on those involved. So the person living with dementia and their families and also the whole of society. They had to be able to be translated into practical impacts. They had to achieve their stated outcome within a reasonable period of time and to be delivered in an equitable way um, in terms of location, um, gender, age, socioeconomic status. These had to be um you know internationally relevant so the first one um first domain was awareness and knowledge and we had two practice recommendations the first was to address the under detection through care professionals and the second one was to raise uh, awareness of the nature and impact in the general population so this is a bit what the recommendations look like we have a headline practice recommendation on the left and then steps solutions um, and options for people to be able to implement the recommendations. Um, now, again, this is sort of, again, highlighting that we understand awareness is a, a very hard thing to be able to, to, to um, add as a, a guideline or a recommendation. But what we've suggested is there's inclusion of training modules. Um, and we're obviously task force doing this throughout our own universities through lectures, adding to undergraduate, postgraduate training levels. We're trying to get the information out there as much as possible through conferences and dissemination. Um, transferring skills and knowledge through clinician friendly guides and short videos, which will be available very soon. Um, this is just to say that the guideline document's quite big and meaty. Uh, and so we're, we're creating some shorter guides that clinicians can pick up that will be directed um, specifically at dementia professionals or hearing provision rather than putting it all together in one document. Uh, and we're lucky enough to have endorsements through various national and international groups uh, and professional bodies. This is just a couple of the, um, the endorsers that we've had who are helping to spread the word um, of, you know, understanding this into the importance of interdisciplinary working. And then this is the awareness of nature in, to be raised in the general public. We have said, you know, we need to include accessible and easy to read and easy to comprehend information on websites where people are likely to be able to read them. So without just putting that out there and no, nothing to do, you know, nothing to sort of help people to, to create the information, this is what we're also doing. Um, so working with people with dementia and their families, we're creating um, brochures and information packs, understanding the links between hearing, vision, and dementia, why they're important and how you can help support people with dementia. So these will be available um, to start with through the SenseCog Toolkit website. Again, there's not quite ready yet, but we hope they'll be there soon. Uh, and these will be downloadable uh, and then can be used within practices. And we'd hope people would download them, and give them out to their patients at a GP level, but also at the secondary care or more specialist clinic level. We had um, recognition and detection as domain two. Domain three was evaluation, uh, looking specifically at taking into account the other aspects so cognitive function that you need to take into account hearing and vision and vice versa um, and this is an example of how you know professionals assessing cognitive function could very quickly simply and easily take into account hearing and vision as part of their clinics um, so we've got things like appointment letters to remind people to bring their best corrected hearing aids and glasses um, screening for hearing and vision, which we had as another recommendation, and routine provision of low cost sensory devices, such as amplifiers and magnif um, uh, magnifiers, which can be used within clinics to help um, gain information about history and also may 
help aid in cognitive testing. So um, there is, uh, on my last slide, there's a, a link to the full guidelines document. I'm happy to take any questions on that afterwards. Um, but I'm going to sort of move on to another project that is very closely linking in with the guidelines, which we've sort of been doing running in tandem, is trying to understand specifically in the memory clinics, um, how we can fit hearing and vision into them and what are the professionals views as the part I'm going to tell you about today. Um, so this is very similar to um, a figure that Ira showed, in fact, I think it's from the same study, that in a, this is a convenient sample from a memory clinic population where they tested people's hearing, you know, retrospectively after they'd had their diagnosis. And we can see that 13% of people attending the uh, clinics had no hearing impairment. 7% were already hearing aid users, but 80% had hearing impairment, which was previously undiagnosed before they took part in this study. So really uh, showing that there is a big unmet need in terms of understanding hearing loss within this population. It's important to address it because it may complicate the assessment. Um, there's misattributing of symptoms, as I've mentioned, by everybody involved the person with dementia their families and also clinicians um, because they are very they very closely over, overlap and um, they can affect cognitive performance so this was a study done a few years ago where they simulated hearing loss whilst undertaking the uh, MMSC and we could see just for, for example the middle bar somebody with a, a, a hearing loss which is between mild and severe we could see that they really would have screened as having moderate levels of dementia. These were all young, healthy people um, with, with you know, top-notch cognitive function, but when they had a simulated hearing loss, their performance on the MMSC was much reduced. So it could be that actually in lots, in, in some people, we are overestimating the level of cognitive impairment um, when actually potentially we could remediate um, their, their supposed cognitive or functional outcomes just by looking at their hearing. And similar, similar for vision, um, it's really important, we felt, um, because it's a good opportunity for early intervention or earliest intervention. If somebody um, can be seen when they're also having their, their uh, diagnosis, there's the best chance that um, they're going to be able to get on well with the hearing uh, aids and glasses, or hopefully um, be able to, you know, when we get the results of the RCT that Ira was telling us about, we'll be able to put in specialist intervention support for them um, and we've seen from a recent study that actually understanding is uh, definitely vision uh, hearing which was what screened in the study is acceptable to patients so um, this was a study from a memory clinic in Dublin which was just published last year where they interviewed 20 patients with mild cognitive impairment who referred to audiology as part of their diagnostic workup 40% of people um, before they had their, their hearing, lot, um, hearing assessed reported, uh, did a self-report of hearing loss, which was compared to 85% who were actually found to have hearing loss. So really sort of suggesting that actually just asking somebody about their hearing or vision um, in a memory clinic population is not very reliable. We'll be missing a large proportion of people who potentially, you know, could, could have an objective hearing loss, which could be treated and managed. They also showed that 75% of um, their patients said that they felt the hearing test was an important part of their dementia assessments. Uh, and 100% of the um, patients interviewed had positive views on incorporating hearing as part of their diagnostic workup. So this is really, really promising um, that actually, if patients find it acceptable, why aren't we doing it? So what we wanted to, to try and address, or what we have been, um, obviously some, some issues with lockdown, is what do professionals feel in, um, in practice we could do? Where is hearing and vision best placed? So the NICE guidelines for dementia assessment refer to hearing and vision um, under the assessment as a potentially reversible cause, is their words. And it says refer on to um, specialist clinics if you still suspect this dementia when hearing and vision amongst other things have been taken into account but there's no further evidence of how to do this why to do this or really that it's important to be able to do this uh, and then there's a another referral to hearing and vision in the management section where they say 
consider referring for hearing and vision testing every two years um, if the patient is not capable of doing so themselves. I'm paraphrasing, but it's similar to that. So we've kind of seen that this professional guidance aimed at memory clinics and, and, and people working within the multidisciplinary teams are supposed to be taking them into account, but not where this should be done or, or how this should be done. So this is what we're doing. Um, we are doing semi-structured interviews with um, memory clinic, people working within the memory clinics and GPs um, to try and understand where this is best placed and, and, and to highlight the importance. So a shameless plug, um, we still need a couple of GPs and, and definitely from an Irish cohort. So if anybody is an Irish uh, GP practicing in Ireland, please uh, get in touch with me if you would like to be involved. I'd love to hear your views on this. Um, some preliminary results, because obviously we haven't finished, we, we still need a, a few more interviews, um, show that actually professionals across the board tend to understand that hearing and vision is important and helpful in terms of understanding then their assessment um, and understanding then what that means for their patient in terms of their likely cognitive function. However, there's a variety of different structures, uh, clinic structures and practices across the UK and Ireland, um, which are wildly different, even within very, very close locations. And I feel like this really impacts on how people then see where hearing and vision would fit in to their practice. So um, there's, there's different, if people think that if they do screen for hearing and vision, is it informal or formal screening? So and lots of lots of clinics actually say, oh, we do ask about hearing and vision. And they simply ask, you know, do you have, do you wear glasses? Do you have hearing aids? Uh, or do you have any hearing loss? It's a yes, no tick box on a performer, which isn't really then followed up um, potentially. Or, um, but as we've seen from the, the, the other Dublin um, study, which I've just highlighted, is actually just asking somebody about their hearing and vision, especially in a memory clinic population, is potentially not very reliable. There's also a very varied uh, perceived acceptability to patients in terms of their um, adding hearing and vision screening to their cognitive assessment or cognitive workup. And again, this is depending on the different structure, um, whether it's you know uh, MDT or whether it's consultant led or nurse led, without really the the big impact, uh, the wider um, feeding in and understanding benefits versus barriers and um, two big themes which come up at the moment are time, the time to be able to do it and the reliability of the screening depending on where it's done. So just to sort of summarise this all together, um, we have created the first set of practice recommendations which are broad but pragmatic recommendations um, directed at clinicians and other professionals involved in the care and support to people with dementia and sensory loss. There are 16 recommendations with solutions to be able to implement the recommendations. And we're trying to, to understand, we know that hearing and vision is important in the memory clinics, but we're trying to um, understand how and where we can best place this to improve outcomes um, for people living with dementia. So thank you very much. Um, I will move on to the uh, next speaker, but just here's a link uh, if anybody is interested in the, um, the international guidelines and they will be on the SenseCog website, the clinician friendly sheets. So thank you, that's all for me. I will stop sharing my screen. That's great, thank you very much, Jenna, for very interesting presentations there. And actually what jumped out at me was that figure you said about 80% of hearing loss potentially undiagnosed, so that's not such a a large figure and you also talked about the possible overestimating of cognitive impairment so some some very interesting points there thanks for sharing those um okay so we're going to go on to our next speaker who's uh, jp Canelli. uh jp is a clinical research manager at st james's hospital dublin and as part of his work on the sense clock project which you heard about earlier he recorded a piece with some research participants on their personal experience of living with hearing loss and dementia and participating in a sensory support intervention to improve quality of life. Uh, so the people you'll hear speaking are Michael and Gail and they very kindly given permission for us to use this recording as part of this webinar. Uh, so over to you JP. Hi morning everyone. So I was a sensory support therapist <clears throat> on the trial. 
So Michael is living with dementia and Gail was his, do his daughter's companion. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so here's the interview. Well, thanks Gail and Michael for taking part um, in the interview today. So I'd just like to start by asking you, why did you agree to take part in the, in the study? Um, I think just because when we're, uh, you know, the lack of kind of things for my dad to do at the time, and we got the chance to kind of, you know, interact with other people and um, obviously help help other people that are coming after him, like myself and my family members that might kind of have the same problems as my dad is having at the moment. So just uh, just to get him kind of out and about and meeting and talking to different people and then to to help kind of research, I suppose, for the future of supporting. Okay. So a combination of helping, helping obviously Michael and helping the wider community as well. Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah. And um, what were your hearing and vision concerns prior to starting on the study? Uh, I could hear sometimes, but I couldn't hear the whole time. Okay. Uh, and uh, sometimes the, the uh, hearing aids weren't good enough. So he had got this uh, set from the hospital previously and they were quite, they were kind of the full earpiece that sat into the ear and um, probably about three days after he got them, like he kind of would, had stopped wearing them and they were hurting his ear and he'd, right. for, he'd forgotten what he needed to do with them and um we hadn't I hadn't been at the appointment with him either uh, because at the time he had to go on his own so I didn't know what to do so um but is the hearing was kind of, was fine in general but then if somebody had his back to him or if the someone had a low tone he couldn't mm. could hear them at all um, and the sight was has he's always had a sight problems okay so yeah, that was just kind of an ongoing issue as opposed to. So really, so the, the A's that you had really weren't kind of fit for purpose, I guess? No. Okay. And how do you think this may have impacted on um, your memory, Michael, and your thinking? Not being able to, to hear probably not being able to use the AIDS. Oh, well, I can hear her. Um, <laughs> Ah no, it was fine. Like it was fine. If she wants me to do something, I, I hear it because yeah. she talks louder than I do mostly. Yeah, I think I think he didn't know he didn't know what he was missing out on until he actually got these hearing aids. So okay, uh, like he hadn't. He was so used to not being able to hear, he didn't even realize that he wasn't hearing everything that was going on. Right. Um, okay. So when he he got the the new ones that he has now, and he wears them every day, mm -hmm. you know, straight away, often louder again, and um, saying what all the time to everything. Whereas like, he he didn't realize he was doing it beforehand. Um. So, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, so, so you really, you really weren't aware of the impact of the hearing deficit on on memory until you got the new hearing aids. Is that what is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's yeah. I don't even know if it necessarily if it has changed from anything from his memory standpoint. Okay, uh, but it has definitely helped the everyday his everyday kind of activities and yeah. Um, okay. yeah. so, so would it be fair to say that it's improved your overall quality of life Michael? Oh without a doubt yeah. 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 Okay yeah. that's good to hear. And um, Would you agree with that as well Gail? Definitely and I think just the whole the whole way 
the study went of kind of the the teaching process and the training on how to look after the aids and how to look after the glasses that repetitious kind of training not only helped them how to to look after them but it it helped us to see that those techniques for every in all aspects of everything that we do with them help because the more he does something the more it it gets embedded and he doesn't forget then so it was good in in lots of kind of twofold not just purely maintenance and the looking after but just kind of a new technique for us to adapt okay so the idea of kind of repetition and doing things over and cementing things um yeah Yeah. that helps you could apply that to other to other areas okay yeah yeah and were there any other ways in which getting the hearing aids helped? Um, uh, anything else you could think of? No, it's just, it's, you know, I'm learning myself to c- contribute to other people, maybe. Yeah, I think just that the, the you know, <clears throat> when you can hear everything, you're, you engage more in what's yeah, going yeah. on and it's not he's not, a, not oblivious to conversations and he he's, gets involved more and then okay. it made things a little bit calmer as well because when he's not shouting like say, my mom would be like you're shouting at me at other whereas now he doesn't need to shout anymore everything's just a lot calmer and the telly's not up through the roof and uh, yeah no def- they definitely have helped in that sense that they've calmed oh, things. so yeah. you're, you're finding that you're more involved Michael than you might have been previous to getting the hearing aids oh yes I would have been yeah great and maybe more connected with family members or okay and what do you have any advice for other people that might be in a similar position as you were prior to you know to, to coming on the, the the sensory intervention yeah well you, you have to have patience to learn because you can only learn off other people mm-hmm. and uh, like Gail does a lot of stuff for, for me with the hearing aids I, I say maybe through laziness uh, I need to change for uh, the uh, battery, battery yeah and um, she does it straight away because i don't want to be messed around with them but i know how to do it myself but okay. she does it and it saves me from doing it so that's it i take the <laughs> the good way out <laughs> but even the like you know you get them in yourself in the morning and he opens the door every night on the the battery yeah. so okay, so yeah. all that that has all sunk in and yeah. he remembers to do it. Uh, okay. Don't have to remind him anymore. Don't have to do it for him. So, yeah, um, yeah. it's forced a habit now. I, th- I think okay. uh, advice, advice to anyone would be to just give it the time that it needs. And it's not, it's not a huge amount of time. Like we would every week met for an hour or, mm. and then, I would put aside 10 minutes as well during the week with my dad to kind of do the cleaning with him and do the the battery change. Sure. And it's really, in the grand scheme of things, like he's fully functional now in putting them in and change the batteries himself if he needs to, yeah. sometimes needs a little bit of help with the cleaning. But for the most part, if he could troubleshoot them if they weren't working himself and get them get them working and um yeah it, def- it definitely has been brilliant and and great support like i, I had mm. to get in contact with time a couple of weeks ago because um there was a kink in one of the tubes okay and, uh she she sent me out extra tubing and stuff like mm. that and we went back last week just for the the checkup so it's and he also, um, when we went for the eye test, the optician 
So another potential issue that was going on. So he has since been referred for that. And we have an appointment in January to get some laser done. So okay. it's a thing at hand. There are other, it had <clears throat> other knock-on effects for my dad that have been beneficial that we wouldn't have, wouldn't have noticed otherwise. It's so, okay. so, yeah. So, so, it's, so, I guess it's, it's made referral to other services easier? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and the I suppose the the ability to get in in contact with those people that we needed to those appointments mm. made easier um, through the through the study. So yeah, brilliant. Okay, so that's great. So overall, you're you've been what I'm gathering is that you had a really good experience um, taking part in the intervention, um, and it seems to have made some genuine um, improvements in your life. Yeah, no, okay. definitely. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks so much for taking part today. It's been great talking to you, okay? Oh, and thank you. And thanks for, for allowing us to be part of it. It was it was brilliant. Okay, thank you. Happy Christmas. There we go. I'm just conscious of um, time, um, Carol, so I'll hand back over to you. Yeah, that's great. Thanks very much, JP, for sharing that with us. And thanks to Michael and Gail as well for uh, giving permission yeah, yeah. To, to share their personal story of that intervention, which was really good to hear. Um, OK, so we'll now hand over to our final speaker. Um, last but not least, Helen Tormey, who's study coordinator for SenseCog Care. So she's going to talk about that project. Over to you, Helen. Thank you, Carol. Um, so my name is Helen and I'm the study coordinator um, for SenseCog Care. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about sensory cognitive health in nursing homes. Sensory cognitive support, barriers, facilitators and solutions. I'm going to outline the sensory cognitive model of place and finish up by um, speaking a bit about SenseCog Care, um, our project. So in Ireland, over 30% of people with dementia live in nursing homes. And of these, 75 to 90% um, have a significant hearing impairment and over 40% have a significant vision impairment. The COVID-19 um, pandemic over the past two years has also had an impact on those with dementia living in nursing homes with hearing and vision impairments. Um, social distancing and masks have compounded communication challenges and non-urgent healthcare such as hearing and vision um, has often been postponed or left unattended. So a number of barriers and facilitators to sensory cognitive health and sensory cognitive support in nursing homes have been um, identified. So some barriers include rejection of devices, uh, for example, forgetting, losing and breaking hearing aids and glasses, inadequate staff knowledge, low prioritization of sensory care within homes and systematic barriers such as staffing and funding. There are, other, there are also facilitators, however, and so this includes staff knowledge, um, individual management plans, family involvement, and also sensory enabling environmental design. So as mentioned previously in this webinar, um, hearing and vision impairments often go underdiagnosed and undertreated. So a recent environmental scan of Canadian specialists um, carried out in Canada by Walter Rich uh, recommended some um, or have kind of collated some recommendations for successful sensory screening in older adults with dementia living in long-term care. So I've pasted just a few of these. There's a lot more. Um, so some, so they kind of provided some tools and strategies for hearing and vision screening. And some hearing strategies include choosing more meaningful stimuli than pure tones. Or an example of strategies for vision screening include bringing the eye chart closer um, than normal. So as well as this, um, Philip Sloan has also um, collated and provided some guidelines to sensory cognitive healthcare in nursing homes um, for people living with dementia. Um, he, sorry, this is quite small, <laughs> but he, he uh, 
the recommendations are kind of organized along a number of domains. Uh, for example, um, the device itself, special considerations in persons with dementia. Um, he also looks at environmental design, for example, um, ensuring optimal lighting in common areas, ensuring optimal lighting in rooms to facilitate reading and hobbies, um, screening and diagnosis, medical management, and also some recommendations around care provider behaviour, for example, ensuring the minimisation of background noise um, during conversations with residents. So a recent, uh, this was mentioned previously, um, but a recent uh, study looking at knowledge, attitudes and practice of sensory health care um, in staff, so this is particularly nursing home care staff um, in the UK, found that self-reported knowledge of screening, diagnosis and impact of sensory cognitive health was low. However, it also did um, stress that there was a strong desire to implement better sensory care among staff. So lastly, a recent um, systematic review uh, carried out by Hannah Cross looking at hearing re rehabilitation for care home residents with dementia um, observed benefits for residents, um, improved communication and quality of life, and also benefits for staff, which was reflected in mood and uh, turnover of staff. The systematic review did also highlight that staff often use improvised communication and that care home environments were typically noisy. Of the 16 studies included, um, there were no full-scale randomized control trials, and the majority of the studies were unimodal interventions. So um, Hannah recommends that interventions should be multi-component, including devices, communication aids, environmental, modif um, environmental modifications within care homes. So taken together by addressing sensory function through staff skills training, systematic pathways and correcting the local environment in addition to correction of, sensory, of the sensory deficit, it is potentially feasible and cost-effective way of significantly improving quality of life and other key outcomes for residents with dementia living in nursing homes. So, what we plan to do is to um, create an intervention for nursing homes, and we are going to be basing this on the sensory cognitive model of place. So the sensory cognitive model of place is based on the model of place, which is an existing framework um, of environmental design for dementia. Sensory cognitive model of place consists of four components. The first is the resident level. So this would include screening assessment, device fitting and adherence support. The second is a staff level. So this would be awareness raising and training in sensory, sensory cognitive healthcare. Third, an environmental level. So this would be mapping and correcting local environment for sensory challenges. And the fourth is an organisational level. So this would be ensuring seamless referral pathways to community professional hearing and vision care providers. So this brings us to the SenseCal Care Project. So the SenseCal Care Project is a feasibility study of hearing and vision support to improve quality of life in care home residents with dementia. I'm just going to outline the project. So the object, the objective um, of the project is to adopt and feasibly test a hearing and vision support intervention for people with dementia in nursing homes. Um, it is a two-year feasibility pilot um, study at the moment. So it consists of two main stages. The first stage we are currently developing. So at stage one, we're developing a SenseCog sensory support intervention. We're doing this through consultation with um, professional and laced stakeholders. It will be guided by the sensory cognitive model of place, which I outlined earlier. Um, so it will be complex, multi-component intervention to support hearing and vision function in residents with dementia in care homes. The intervention will be delivered by sensory champions. These will be elected nursing home staff uh, who will be trained in the intervention and supported by a research therapist. 
And then the second part of the study will be the feasibility pilot cluster randomized trial. So we're hoping to carry out the intervention um, in 10 nursing homes uh, all across Ireland, randomized into an intervention group and a care as usual group. And um, we will assess the intervention um, using a blinded researcher, um, looking at things like uh, quality of life of care home residents, um, how feasible it was to implement it, um, and any kind of barriers and stuff to that. And we'll be doing that at baseline, three month and six month follow up. Um, so if you want to learn anything else or want any more information about uh, our study, you can contact me here at this email. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Helen, for that nice overview of the Sense Cog Care project, which is just starting in Ireland. And it's very exciting to, to see that launching here. Um, so we're now going to open the floor to any questions. I know there's been a few questions coming in and our speakers have been responding to some of them as we as we go along. So uh, thanks for those questions so far. Um, so let's just see what's what's coming through there. So someone saying there, um, as a person with dementia, I find the statistics disturbing, but happy to see positive steps to address. Yeah, um, you know, there's been some interesting statistics, all right, uh, in terms of, as I was saying earlier, the under diagnosis of, of hearing loss, et cetera. Um, so great to see these research projects addressing some of those issues. Okay. Uh, could you show Helen's email address again, please? Okay, so uh, Helen, I don't know if you just want to put that in the chat, maybe. And uh, that's great. Yeah, I'll do that now. Lovely, thank you. Uh, some people having to, to dash away to huddles and various meetings. Um, so uh, Irisima shared there, you might see on the, the chat, um, there was a question about what screening uh, methods are recommended in a clinic. Uh, so Irisima shared there, Walter, which does nice review on this. So there's a link there for that. And if there's anything that people miss, feel free to email me directly, crogan at tcd.ie uh, with any follow-up questions. Um, as I said earlier, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later today. So you just go into YouTube and, and look up Dementia Research Network Ireland. You will find it there. Um, so there was also mention of a, a, sensory, a sensory support therapy manual, which is available on the SenseCog website. So just remind people of Sense. It's, so the SenseCog website is sense-cog.eu. So there's lots of um, information there, including that support therapy manual. Okay, just... Carol, just to add, mm -hmm. um, we haven't quite put this, the sensory manual up yet, but over by spring that will be available together with the oh, toolkit, yeah. including different uh, screening tools and bits of advice, and, and also the cheat sheets that Jenna was talking about regarding the international guidelines. Um, and apologies about the screening, I realized it was the clinic, and I sent Walter's paper, which is really about care homes. Um, so what we have been also using is a simple device called the HearCheck, but there are all kinds of um, devices like that on the market as well as online tools but then you just need to get the calibration correct so usually this, the hearing screen can take you know less than five minutes and is very well tolerated by people okay great thank you and jenna i don't know if you wanted to mention that study again you said that you were recruiting gps so again using this platform i suppose if there's anyone online that might want to take part in your research. So maybe you just want to remind people of what that study is again. Shameless click. Yes, thank you. So we are looking at um, professionals' views on hearing and vision um, within memory services and wanted to add a, a primary care level to it as well. So kind of really sort of addressing where to best place this. Um, we have loads, well not loads, but I think we, we have enough uh, information from MDT specialist memory services we just need some more GPs um, and we have a few GPs from um, the UK but we haven't actually got any from Ireland at the moment so it'd be really good if there's any Irish GPs um, I keep saying Irish GPs GPs who are working in Ireland <laughs> um, or Irish GPs uh, who would be happy to take part so 10-15 minutes max interview um, with me over Zoom ask a few questions I'd be really really grateful um, I think my email address was in the chat I can repost it uh, and if, or if anybody knows anybody and would, could share the message, that'd be brilliant. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Jenna. And I know, Jenna, you provided a link as well to the guidelines that you um, you did your presentation on earlier. So again, people can find that in the chat. And again, this will all be available on the recordings. And also the PowerPoint presentations will be available on our website, dementianetwork.ie, under the resources tab. So feel free to have a look at that. Um, so some people saying, great to see the background and the info for the new project on SenseCog. Yeah, SenseCog Care. Yeah, great. Um, and there was great interest in this webinar, which, um, you know, is, is interesting. You know, there's obviously a lot of interest in this particular topic. And so uh, hopefully people will be able to follow SenseCog Care and the SenseCog project as well and uh, get access to resources and information on, on the various websites. Okay. Carol, may I just jump yeah. in? Uh, apologies, Helen, if you mentioned it, but uh, just to let people know that SenseCog Care is running for two years. Um, it's a fairly, well, it's, it's, it's a big project, but it's short, and it's to set us up for doing a definitive study in the future. And in Australia, very similar protocol is being undertaken and is funded there as well. So we have the two projects going concurrently so that we can share learning and information. So um, watch this space. Great, thanks, Sarasima. And there's a comment here, um, Susanna, who's I know, a speech and language therapist who joined us today, and she's saying that um, measuring everyday conversations is complex, but often a good reflection on potential impacts of an intervention. I don't know if anyone wants to make a comment on that. Would you agree? <laughs> I, I think yeah. absolutely agree, yeah. but, but <laughs> complex, complex, particularly in the context of the care yeah. homes. So, but uh, very interesting. Um, uh, potential outcome that one could look at. Um, and somebody's saying here, members of the Dementia Research Advisory Team, uh, so that's from the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland, uh, are engaging as PPI contributors. Um, we're very excited to be involved. Yep, so that's great. And uh, that's a you know relatively new team that was set up in the Alzheimer's Society of Ireland. So great to see that team being actively engaged in, in research, which is, which is great. Um, Okay, so food for thought for people. Great, that's great to hear. Um, okay, so yeah, the toolkit available in spring, as we said. Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, so I think that's all the, the questions and comments. And thank you to everybody who joined us today. As I said, we had a, a good turnout. Um, and I'm sure more people will be watching back uh, the recording. Uh, we have someone from the Republic of Moldova. So yeah, we usually get a bit of an international audience. So you're, you're very welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, and I'd like to thank our speakers. So uh, Professor Irasima Leroy, uh, Dr. Jenna Littlejohn, JP Connelly and, or Connolly, and Michael and Gail, who spoke during the, um, the recording, and Helen Torby. And thanks everybody again. And we're, we're seeing uh, people dialing in from Australia and Portugal and all over the world. So um, we're getting the, the SenseCog message out there uh, in, a, in a very broad way. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Carol. Thanks. Thank you.